gifts. Humility is the currency in which God deals. Humility is the attribute which aligns with the nature of heaven itself. The moment we align with humility, we start to connect with God. The culture of the pit of hell is a culture of pride, self-promotion, self-exaltation. Let that not be the culture of our conversations. Come on, let that not be the culture of our hearts and our homes and our foyers and our workplaces. No, let's have a culture of humility. Welcome to the Calvary Podcast. For more information about a Calvary campus near you or to join us online, visit our website, calvarycc.global. I want to speak to uh, you today about attracting the favour of God. How many people this morning in all of our locations would say, I want the favour of God upon my life? Let's give us a wave. Look at that, 34 people on the Sunshine Coast. Everyone in Port Moresby has their hands up. In Cairns, people are applauding. How many people would say, I want the favour of God upon my life? You know, um, it's possible to be loved by God, but not experience God's favour. You know, I'm really grateful that God's love is unearned and undeserved. I'm super grateful for that, that no matter what we've done, no matter where we are, God loves us. There's nothing we can do to deserve or to merit God's love. Praise God for that. But but God's favour is a different thing. God's favour comes upon people who possess a particular attitude. And every one of us can choose that attitude. At 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 7, says this, In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. I'm actually getting that printed and putting it on my kids' walls. All of you, oh, here we go, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. No one was excited about that word. God shows favour to the humble. So if God shows favour to the humble, what should we do? Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Favour literally means grace. It means goodwill. It means reward. And here's the good news for all of us this morning, that every one of us can experience God's favour. How many people know that's good news? We can all experience God's favour, but here's the bad news. It comes at the cost of our pride. That's why I prayed that God would deal with our hearts this morning. The Bible says God opposes the the proud, but gives favour favour to the humble. This is a promise that is set forth by Peter in the Bible passage we've just read. It's repeated in the book of James and it actually traces its roots right back to the Old Testament book of Proverbs. Proverbs 3 verse 33 says, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Toward the scorners, he is scornful, but to the humble, he gives favour. So if there is one attribute that God loves, it's humility. And if there is one attribute that God loathes, it's pride. Proverbs 6 verse 16 says this, these six things the Lord hates. Cats. No, sorry, I made that up. Um, So that was in the version I was reading. Uh, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Here's the first one on the list, a proud look. Isn't that amazing? Out of, if the Bible is saying these are the things that God hates, this is the God that we've all been worshipping this morning. It, these are the things that he hates. Top of the list of the things that God hates, a proud look. You know, humility is from the Latin word humilis, which means low or lowly. Uh, comes from the word humus, which means ground. Uh, humility literally means to be low to the ground, or it means this, to lower yourself. Who knows that is contrary to the spirit of the world, which is always promoting itself, exalting itself, 
puffing itself up, that the attitude that God loves to show favor to is the attitude that is willing to lower itself to the ground. That's the kind of attitude God loves to bless. Now, when I say today that God is opposed to pride and arrogance, um, most of us today, I would assume pretty much all of us in Port Moresby, Cairns, here on the Sunshine Coast, almost all of us are probably going to nod in agreement because it's not hard for me to sell you on the idea that humility is a virtue. In fact, we all have a type of inner revulsion to pride and arrogance, and yet all of us tend to have this inner inclination towards humility. We we all tend to warm towards people who demonstrate humility. Let, let me give you an example on both sides of the ledger to make the point. Uh, there's a story told of the great boxer Muhammad Ali when he was at the peak of his powers. Uh, Ali was on a flight to defend his heavyweight title and the plane hit severe turbulence. So, so the crew of the plane went up and down the aisle to ensure that everyone was buckled in. And when the flight attendant came to Muhammad Ali, she noticed that he had his seatbelt undone. So the flight attendant says to Muhammad Ali, uh, excuse me, sir, would you, would you fasten your seatbelt? The captain has advised that all passengers need to put their seatbelts on. And uh, Muhammad Ali looked right back at the flight attendant and said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. To which the flight attendant replied, well, Superman don't need no plane. Put your seatbelt on. <laughs> Who knows, you admire the boxer, but, but you kind of don't really love the arrogance, do you? Uh, now, story for the opposite side of the ledger. Uh, I read recently of an interaction that took place in an upmarket jewellery store in Sydney in Australia. Uh, an American man walked in and asked to buy a pink argyle diamond, which is one of the most expensive diamonds in the store. Well, of course, the shop attendant wanted to make sure everything was perfect and smooth about the transaction because this was a big transaction. And yet during the credit card transaction, the store's computer froze. Well, the lady who worked in the store, she's freaking out, she's embarrassed, and uh, particularly because of the size of the transaction, she wants this one to go right. And uh, yet the customer didn't make a scene. The customer just leant over the counter, punched a few keys, and the computer came back to life. And the woman said in relief, oh, you know a little bit about computers, do you? He just nodded and finished the transaction and left the store. Turns out there was a Microsoft convention being held and it was Bill Gates who was buying the diamond. You know a little bit about computers, do you? Now, I'm a Mac user through and through, but the story still makes us smile. Why? Because all of us have this moral assumption that to be down to earth is somehow more virtuous than big noting ourselves and always flexing and trying to exert our power. You know, it hasn't always been that way in the history of humanity. In fact, in the ancient Greek and Roman cultures, humility was actually despised and instead they loved and pursued honour and power. Um, the Australian hi uh, historian, who, who's a Christian man, John Dixon, has a great book called Humilitas. And uh, look what he, he explains. He says, honour was universally regarded as the ultimate asset for human beings. And shame was the ultimate deficit. So much so that academics frequently refer to Egyptian, Greek and Roman societies simply as honour, shame cultures. Much of life revolved around ensuring you and your family received public honour and avoided public shame. Now, all of this might be hard for moderns to understand. That's because most of us no longer live in an honour-shame society. Our key access points are things like good, evil, pleasure, suffering, and prosperity, poverty. Honour and shame still have some value for us. Who doesn't crave a bit of praise and who doesn't want to avoid public embarrassment? But few of us would regard these things as the defining parameters of life. By contrast, without denying the importance of goodness, pleasure and prosperity, most ancient Greeks and Romans would not have thought about such things as the goals of human endeavour. Aristotle's 3rd century BC dictum seemed to, to them eminently sensible. Honour and reputation are among the pleasantest things through each person's imagining that he has the qualities of an important person and all the more so when others say so. John Dixon goes on to point out that the ancient Greek document, the Delphic Canon, which was written in 600 BC, 
Uh, it was like a, an Old Testament book of wisdom. Uh, sorry, not Old Testament. It was a, an old Greek book of wisdom, and it contained 147 maxims or proverbs, which were thought to be the summation of an ethical life. You know, of the 147 maxims or proverbs in the Delphic canon, there is not even one mention of the word or the theme humility. You see, in Greco-Roman culture, humility was just not on the radar. And that could not be more different to our modern version of ethics and our modern idea of an ethical life. For example, um, Forbes magazine a little while ago ran an article called The Top 10 Characteristics of Highly Admired People. Yeah, and you know what was the, to- the, the number one characteristic of highly admired people, according to Forbes magazine? Humility was at the top of the list. And, and so you've got to ask... What changed? How did we go from cultures where where honour was seen as the most highest virtue to be prized to now a a culture where even Forbes magazine says the best attribute you can possess is humility? What what changed there? Is everyone still following on the Sunshine Coast? Cairns, Port Moresby, you're still with me? Well, here's what changed. John Dixon, as a historian, makes the case that the catalyst for this shift in the ethical paradigm in society was actually a Jewish man from Nazareth. You see, into that first century honour-shame culture where Caesars literally published their own acclaim. Don't roll your eyes, you all do that on social media. And great ones lauded it over their subjects. This Jew from Nazareth called Jesus stood in stark contrast. You know, one of the most amazing things about the Bible, especially when you consider it's a first century text written in that culture, is that it never tries to conceal the fact that Jesus was from very humble upbringings. Jesus was born in a stable to a poor unwed teenage mother and Jesus' manner of life and his teaching was actually marked by humility. Jesus said in Matthew 11 verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus says, I'm meek, and I'm lowly of heart. And this was exactly as the prophet Zechariah foretold. In Zechariah 9 verse 9, he wrote of the coming Messiah, and he said, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. I mean, not on a stallion, riding on a donkey. If it was written today, it would say driving in a Kia. I say that as a Kia driver. Sarah and I celebrated our 16th wedding anniversary this week and we had a very 16th wedding anniversary moment driving to our restaurant booking four kids in the back of the Kia Carnival. We thought we have made it in life. Anyway, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Who knows? Proud people love to flex. Proud people love to let you know that they're powerful. Proud people love to let you know of their exploits. Proud people love to drop things in conversation just so you're aware where they stand on the social ladder. They love to puff out their chest and make their strength known. But who knows, there was nothing in Jesus like that. He he comes into Jerusalem lowly, riding on a donkey. In fact, the foal of a donkey. It wasn't just Jesus' teaching or Jesus' manner of life, though, that reframed humility in the Western imagination. Ultimately, it was the way that Jesus died. Think about this, in an honour-shame culture, the reason why crucifixion was the chosen method of execution is because it was the ultimate in public shaming. They didn't just kill you in a back room, no, they shamed you publicly. Nobody, nobody wanted to end their life on a cross being publicly shamed. But, But the scandal of Jesus' life is that Jesus' crucifixion wasn't some unfortunate accident. Rather, Jesus voluntarily chose the cross as an act of service by taking the place of a sinner and bearing sin's penalty in himself. And so you've got to think about this. 
Think about the earliest followers of Jesus who have been born and raised and educated in an honor-shame culture where the highest virtue to prize is to be publicly honored. And the thing that you want to avoid at all costs is shame and embarrassment. They, they've grown up in, in, in that environment, in the greenhouse of that thinking, and yet they come face to face with this man called Jesus of Nazareth. They come to realize that this is God in flesh. This is the creator God revealing himself to humanity and they see him directing his life toward a bloody, shameful Roman cross. Who knows, it took a little bit for them to wrestle with the implications of what this meant for how they ought conduct themselves. And so they realized that in Jesus, the God of heaven, I want you to follow me now, had literally lowered himself to our level. And then having lowered himself, he humbled himself even further by going to the lowest place imaginable, death on a cross. And it was that realization that turned their ethical assumptions upside down. Who knows, maybe in first century Western culture, we would do well to revisit these ideas. And so they realized this, that if God saw fit to empty himself. If God, the most high God, chose to lower himself in the person of Jesus, then who am I to puff myself up and exalt myself? That's not even how God behaves. So why would I behave like that? And so that's why the first Christians started to live counterculturally, where they had once shunned humility now they started to embrace humility as a virtue. We read this in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. Is everyone still following me so far? It says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. There were no other first century texts promoting humility. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but rather he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And then being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." John Dixon summarizes it this way. He says, humility came to be valued in Western culture as a consequence of Christianity's dismantling of the all-persuasive, all-pervasive honor-shame paradigm of the ancient world. Today, it doesn't matter what your religious views are, Christian, atheist, Jedi, knight, if you were raised in the West, you are likely to think that honor-seeking is morally questionable and lowering yourself for the good of others is ethically beautiful. It's unlikely that any of us would aspire to this virtue were it not for the historical impact of his crucifixion on art, literature, ethics, law, and philosophy. Our culture remains cruciform long after it stopped being Christian. Isn't it amazing the difference that Jesus has made on society? And so it's no stretch to say this morning, that the reason why our culture today, even people who say they hate God, yet in the next breath, they admire humility. Well, well, the reason that is, is because of the legacy of the life and the death of Jesus. And so when we see Jesus, we see how it is that we came to esteem humility above pride. And we also see why it is that God hates pride. Now, some of you are thinking, God's not allowed to hate anything. Isn't God just all love? He's like a big squishy marshmallow and he just loves everything and affirms everything and is kind towards everyone. No, no, no. The Bible says there are certain things God loves and there are certain things God hates. And who knows, we do well to look at which of the things God hates. God hates pride, not because God hates people, but God hates pride, and I want you to follow this now, because it's the exact opposite of God's own nature. Now, can I give you some theology today? Has everyone had three people on the Sunshine Coast are excited? Someone in the back row is like, Theola, Theola, what? Do you say coffee? I'll have a coffee. Um, Let's just go a little bit, can we go a little bit deeper? In Port Moresby, they're ready for it. But 
God hates pride because it's the opposite of the very DNA of God. The Bible reveals God as one God, but three persons. God is a trinity. The matrix didn't come up with that term. The theologians did many, many hundreds of years ago. God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And whenever the Bible gives us glimpses into the nature of God, we see that the Spirit glorifies the Son, and the Son glorifies the Father, and the Father glorifies the Son. And John 17, 5 tells us that this dance of humility, this dance of glorifying the other, is actually how the triune God has conducted itself for all of eternity. In fact, when the Bible, some of you are like, where is this going? Just hang with me, okay? I'm going somewhere. When the Bible peels back the curtain and reveals the nature of God, we see that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, none of them are characterized by self-centeredness. But rather, all of them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are actually characterized by mutually self-giving love. You could say it this way, no member of the Trinity seeks glory for themselves, but each person of the Trinity voluntarily adores and defers to and rejoices in the others. Now, if this is what God has been like for all of eternity, it would make sense then that when God enters into human history as a man, that that man would not come grasping for power, that man would not come seeking exaltation, but that man would, would come with a heart to serve. Didn't Jesus say, I've not come to be served, but to serve? Jesus didn't adopt that attitude when he was born of the virgin. That was actually the attitude of Jesus, the son of God, the second member of the Trinity for all of eternity, because that's what God is like. God is constantly deferring to, exalting, honoring the other. Again, who knows, our culture would do well to take a look at this afresh today. And so God doesn't change. And so when God came into human history, Jesus continued in the same manner of life that he'd done for all of eternity. And so if humility is the attitude of Christ, then it would follow that pride would be the anti-Christ attitude. Do you catch what I'm saying today? And this is exactly what we see. The prophet Isaiah gives us this glimpse into an eternal scene, which is kind of mysterious, but it points to the nature of Lucifer, Satan, the antichrist attitude. It says this, this is Lucifer, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high, but you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of of the pit. Did you see the difference in attitude? Lucifer said, I will ascend to heaven. And yet Jesus said, I will descend to earth. Lucifer said, I will set my throne on high. Jesus said, I'm willing to be born into a manger. Lucifer said, I will be seated among the important. Jesus said, you can crucify me among thieves. Lucifer said, I will ascend to the heights of the clouds. Jesus said, I'm willing to go down to the depths of the grave. Lucifer said, I will make myself like God. And so Jesus said, you know what? I will make myself like man. Don't you love the nature of Jesus? And so this is why when Lucifer exalted himself, Jesus said he was cast down like lightning. And yet Jesus humbled himself. And because Jesus humbled himself, God exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name. And now you see why God cannot bless pride. You see, God can't bless pride because to do so would be for God to affirm the very opposite of his own nature. Is this making sense today? Listen, God opposes the proud, not because God hates people, but because pride is the opposite of himself. But on the flip side, that's why when God sees humility, God can't help himself. God loves to pour out blessing and grace and increase and favor to people who exhibit humility because when God the Father sees humility in a human heart, he starts to see the attitude that looks like the attitude of Jesus himself. Listen, you and I are never more like Jesus than when we're taking the lowly place and wearing 
wearing humility as our clothing. But once we start to strut around the place and flex and let everyone know how powerful we are and bark orders and think that we're all that in a bag of chips, the who knows, the moment we start acting like that, God has to take his hand off our life because he can't. Listen, I want God's hand upon Calvary Church. I want God's hand upon your life. And it doesn't come down to our smarts. It doesn't come down to our money. It doesn't come down to where you sit on the org chart. It all comes down to, is there an attitude of humility in my heart? Come on, do you believe that today? So, so as we close, let me share three things that God gives us when we embrace humility. And let me tell you, this is, this is not one of those things where we think, yeah, I nailed that. I reckon I developed humility about 15 years ago. Who knows, humility is like a garden that you have to keep giving attention to. Our hearts are insidiously proud. In fact, I can be preaching this sermon on humility thinking this is probably the best sermon on humility these people have ever heard. I think it was Augustine who said, pride is the mother of all sins. And so, listen, even if you think, I reckon, I've got this. Listen, all of us, I reckon we are all microseconds away from pride at any given point in time. It's the one virtue that when you think you've nailed it, you've probably lost it. (laughs) So, So here's the three things God gives us when we constantly clothe ourselves with humility. Number one is this, he gives us grace. Now, there's various forms of grace. There is forgiving grace. Some of us are like, oh, thank God for his grace. Like 12 years ago when I became a Christian, he gave me grace and washed my past away. There is forgiving grace and thank God for his grace that cleanses us from sin. But grace is more than that. It also means favour. It also means reward. James 4, 6 says, be clothed with humility because God resists the proud, but he gives grace and favour to the humble. You know, I really believe that humility will take you further than your gifting will. Humility will take you further than your LinkedIn profile will take you. Humility will take you more than your budget will take you. Humility will take you more than your family of origin can take you. Humility is the attribute that when you bring yourself under the hand of God, God says, now I'm going to start to exalt you and give you grace and favour. Listen, I believe that all of us can experience the favour of God. That's going to look different on each and every person. Never look at the favour of God on someone else and get envious and jealous because God's favour on their life is going to look different to God's favour on your life, but we all have this in common. Cairns, Moresby, Budrum, we all have this in common. If you will submit yourself to the dealings of God, then God will show you grace and favour in whatever sphere of influence you're in. I want the grace of God upon my life. Listen, if you want to do it alone, all power to you. But if God is giving out grace, I want His grace upon my life. Who knows? It's that little bit extra where people say, how did that happen? What happened there? And who knows? You can't explain it except that I just kept humbling myself under the hand of God and God just kept on elevating and showing grace and favour toward us. Are you with me today? And so God will give us grace if we embrace humility. I really sense there's some people in church today and you're striving and you're starting to get frustrated, even bitter and resentful towards God because you feel like God has not done what he should have done based on what you've done for him. I want to tell you, just keep yourself in the humble place. Keep yourself in the lowly place. Keep a sweet spirit towards God. Submit yourself to the dealings of God. Whatever season, that God, I just believe that if I just stay humble before you, God, you can open up doors through your grace that nothing else could do. Do you believe that today? Number two is this, God gives us promotion. Scripture says, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up. Literally means exalt you in due time. I love what Matthew Henry, the Bible commentator, said. He said, his hand is almighty and can easily pull you down if you be proud. How many people have seen people who were once mighty? It's amazing how quickly people can fall. It's amazing. You think that kingdom will never be shaken, and yet it's all gone. Why? Because God takes his hand off a person's life because pride comes in. Matthew Henry says, uh, or God can exalt you if you be humble. And it will certainly do it either in this life, if he sees it best for you, or at the day of general retribution. You, You read through the history of all the kings of Israel in the Old Testament. So long as they remained humble and didn't let success go to their head, God poured more grace and favor and promotion upon them. But the moment pride started to corrupt their heart, they and their kingdom began to crumble. I love what um, G.K. Chesterton, 
one of the great thinkers of the last 100, 150 years, wrote in his book, Orthodoxy. He argued, and I want you to catch this, Chesterton argued that human pride is the engine of mediocrity. It's a great thought. Companies become mediocre when their leadership gets proud. Christians become mediocre when their hearts get proud. Marriages become mediocre when husband or wife or both get proud and stubborn. You don't have to amen, just look straight ahead. It's fine. You don't have to make eye contact. Who knows? This is what pride does. Pride fools us into thinking that we've arrived. I've made it. And, and, and that we're complete. And that there's very little for us to learn. But, but who knows? Where there's no humility, we stop growing. Where, where there's no humility, we stop being teachable. Our hearts stop being malleable. And so we start to become mediocre. We stop being open to correction. The pastor corrects or, or a connect group leader corrects. And we need to find a new church because clearly Calvary's lost the anointing. No, no, it's just that you're proud. Your, your heart, sorry, I didn't mean to point at people then. But your, your heart can become proud. Who knows? When you get proud, you stop listening. You stop learning. And so what happens is you become unusable and God can't promote you any further. But where there is a spirit of humility, God can entrust us with more and more. And listen, God is not against you being blessed. God is not against you having an expansive life. So long as you can keep a posture of humility, then God can keep giving you more and more and more to steward. Look at what Martin Luther said. Luther said this, I like it. God created the world out of nothing. So as long as we're nothing, he can make something out of us. It's a good thought, isn't it? Matthew 5 verse 5, Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Listen, my heart for you is this, that just like in Revelation, that the elders, that they, they have crowns upon their head, but they take those crowns and in the presence of the Lord Jesus, they throw those crowns down before the Lord. That, that if you and I, as God continues to place his hand upon our life, we just keep throwing it before the Lord and saying, you know what? It's all from him. It's all through him. And it's all back to him. God, I'm not going to drink the glory. This is all yours. It's all from your hand. As we continue to do that, if we keep on praying, God, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Glory. If you can keep that attitude, God will keep expanding your territory. You'll inherit the earth. But the moment you start to think it's because of my power, it's my kingdom, this is my thing, then God, I, I, I just can't bless that attitude because the only other place I've seen that attitude is in Lucifer. And I can't bless that. Listen, just hold lightly the blessing of God in your life. Don't, don't let it go to your head. Just, just keep pouring it back out to the Lord and watch how God keeps. Is this helping anyone today? Come on, just, just, I know it's countercultural, but we need to keep on embracing the lowly place. I'm not entitled to anything. I'm, 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 I'm living on borrowed breath, to be honest. It's all from God. And if I can keep that attitude, God can keep exp- Number, whatever, three. I lost count. There's only three points. <laughs> Number three, last one is this. He gives us peace. I wonder if you've ever considered this. This, this passage in 1 Peter 5, it's talking about pride and humility. And then in the very next breath, there's a teaching on anxiety. And most of us rip this verse out of context on its own and just teach about how to get free of anxiety. But we don't set it in the context. He's saying, listen, clothe yourself in humility. God opposes, he'll give you grace if you're humble. And then look at what it says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Here's a thought. Is it an accident that we are the most self-promoting, self-celebrating, self-affirming and anxious generation on the planet? Is there a connection there? So, so here's the thought. It's actually through humility that we find peace in ourselves. You know, pride gets us thinking that we are so important, we hold the whole world together. If I wasn't here, this whole place would fall apart. But who knows? That's why people are filled with such anxiety. Because you think you're God. It's amazing the peace that comes when you give God his job back. So actually, I don't hold the world together. If Dustin Bell wasn't at Calvary Church, it would keep on going perfectly fine. If if you left your workplace, it would probably keep on going perfectly fine. Self-importance actually brings anxiety because we start to think, this is all on me. Listen, it's not all on you. For many thousands of years, the earth was doing fine before Bell arrived. 
and it will do fine after Bell leaves. Who knows, we do well to just release a bit of that self-importance and it's amazing how peace comes. You know, it's through humility that we find peace with other people. You know, some people's lives are always full of quarrelling and drama. There's always a dispute or something going on and, and typically where you find an inability to say sorry, you'll find quarrelling. Just got really quiet on the Sunshine Coast. Who knows, humility is able to say, sorry, I got that wrong. But pride can't do that. Pride always has to point to how it was other people's fault. Humility can say, you know what, that was my fault. Humility is able to say, you're right. It's amazing how that disarms an argument. You know what, you're right. What does the person say back to that? I know! Full stop. It's amazing how you can have months of quarrelling ended by just a moment of humility. How many marriages could have been saved with just a bit of humility? How many churches could have remained united with a bit of humility? How many friendships or business partnerships could have stayed intact if pride had not come in the way? Wherever you find pride, you'll find disorder, disruption and disunity. In a marriage, in a home, in a workplace, in a church, humility is the key to unity in our lives. Is this making sense today? It's gotten real quiet this morning. Last thought is this, humility, it's, it's how we get peace with ourselves. It's how you get peace with others. Humility is actually how you get peace with God. What the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. You know, God actually doesn't need all of our smarts and all of our brilliance, but when we humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, then God hears from heaven and and he forgives our sin and heals our land. Listen, all God needs from you and I is humility. If you're in Port Moresby today and you're wondering, what does God require of me? Do I have to come to church for six months? Do I have to clean up my act? Do I have to quit doing this, that and the other? Listen, all God requires of you and I is humility. And the moment there's humility, God hears that prayer all the way from heaven. Why? Because humility is the, the, the tone in which God God speaks. Humility is the currency in which God deals. Humility is the attribute which aligns with the nature of heaven itself. The moment we align with humility, we start to connect with God. Two more thoughts. 1 John 1 verse 8 and 9. Has this helped anyone today? Some of you are like, yeah, uh, this, I've written out all these notes to give them to people in my row. <laughs> Just try it out in the foyer after the service in Cairns. That was a great message for you. 1 John 1 verse 8. If we say we have no sin, you're kidding yourself. It wasn't my fault. No, it's just just my temperament. It's just the way I was born. No, it's their fault. Oh, if you understood the family, oh, how do you expect with the government? Listen, if we say we have no sin, you're kidding yourself. And the truth is not in you. But if we confess our sin, what's that? Humility. God, I've missed the mark. I miss the mark a thousand times a day. God, it, it, I, God, I need you. If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unright. Religion will have you thinking you need to do a thousand things in order for God to love and accept you. In fact, there's only one thing you need, humility. And if you've got humility, you'll receive everything that God has for your life. Last quote, and I love this. Andrew Murray, the great Christian author, said this, pride needs to die in us for anything of heaven to live in us. Listen, I want my heart, I want our church to reflect the culture of heaven. And the culture of heaven is a culture of humility, where Christ, the Lamb of God, is front and centre, the one who humbled and lowered himself. And then those around him who worship humble themselves. And listen, the the, the culture of the pit of hell is a culture of pride, self-promotion, self-exaltation. Let that not be the culture of Calvary Church. Let that not be the culture of our conversations. Come on, let that not be the culture of our hearts and our homes and our foyers and our workplaces. No, let's have a culture of humility that says, you know what, I'm willing to take the lowly place. I I can clean that up. I can do that job. I can say sorry. Uh, Listen, I'm not above any of that. Listen, if you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. And, And we've just got this culture in our church where we say, you know what, if Christ humbled himself, who am I to flex and parade and act like I'm a big shot? No, no, no. God 
clothed himself in humility. And if God did that, then I can do the same. And I I just think if we all embrace that attitude, you watch how God shows grace and favour and rewards that attitude more and more. Come on, why don't we stand? For more information about a Calvary campus near you or to join us online, visit our website, calvarycc.global.